You're trying to lose fat on hard mode. Here's why you're failing. You've killed your metabolism. In fact, often people make four mistakes that destroy their metabolism. You've got a slow metabolism. Good luck trying to burn body fat. Let's talk about this. Hard mode. Video oh, game yeah. reference. Yeah, I know. Very good I like there. It. Huh? So uh, let's, we'll, we'll quickly talk about or list what these four things are. Yeah, but list then, them and then we'll go into And it. then we got to break it down because once I say these, everyone's going to be like, huh? That makes no sense. Uh, so here are the four big mistakes that people make uh, that destroy their metabolism, make fat loss impossible. Eat less. They do a lot of cardio. They take fat burners, fat burning supplements, and they skip meals. Those are the four mm -hmm. metabolism killers. Yeah, I think that it's important because you're going to get, uh, for sure, especially since most people only listen to the first 30 seconds and then they make a, a decide, judgment on what you're going to say, right. that you're not destroying your metabolism. The metabolism is doing what you tell it it's to adaptive. do. Yeah, it's adaptive. Yeah, it's adapting and it's recoverable. Uh, it's just not ideal. And unfortunately, most of all those things that you just listed is what most people think they should do when they are going to embark on a fat loss journey. That's I've right. put on this weight. I've fallen off the wagon. I haven't been going to the gym. I haven't been doing these things. I know I don't eat good. I know I drink. I know I do all these things that are bad for me. Okay, it's time to change my life. Here's the steps. I'm going to start doing cardio. I'm going to eat less food. I'm going to skip some meals if I need to. Uh, I'm going to take the latest, greatest fat burners that are on the market and uh, and hop on this the treadmill. literally your go-to plan. Yeah. yeah and what, what it looks like, and I'll paint the picture, right? If you do those four things, here's what it looks like. You'll lose some weight initially. Then you'll plateau real hard, and you'll find yourself in this really uh, difficult place where you're already doing a lot of cardio. You're already eating very little. And you still have 15 pounds to lose or whatever. And you're stuck. And you're like, okay, what do I got to do? Eat even less? Do even more cardio? Skip meals even more? And you're just stuck in this in this crazy plateau. And then worse, you go have a weekend out with your friends. You come back and you gain weight all of a sudden. And you're so, your body, it's like your body is ready to gain body fat. So let's, let's talk about the metabolism first before we talk about kind of what's going on. So metabolism really is just your body's ability to convert food into energy. Uh, it's the it's the very, very complex process of taking what you eat and turning it into things that your body needs and uses to repair tissue, to build muscle, to fuel your brain, your movement. Um, it, it's, it's the conversion of food into energy, and it is a very complex, complex process. Now, when it comes to weight loss, uh, first off, what we're going to start to, talk, to say here is fat loss, because Weight loss isn't necessarily fat loss. Mm -hmm. People don't want to lose muscle, or you shouldn't want to lose mm -hmm. muscle. Muscle is something you should want to keep. It looks good. It's sculpted. It is healthy. It's body fat people want to get rid of. So uh, let's talk primarily about fat loss and body composition change, meaning you know more muscle, um, less body fat. So in order to lose body fat or just weight, you do need to take in less calories than you burn. But I can also flip that and say you need to burn more calories than you take in. It's the same thing. It's the same formula. And there's two ways you can approach this. I can either A, try to burn more calories on this end, or B, try to take in less calories. But the burn more calories part, this is where things get a little bit interesting. You can try moving more to burn more calories, or I could teach my body to burn more calories on its own. That's the sustainable approach. Yeah. That's the faster metabolism that you want because then that requires less work from you. It doesn't. It, it means you don't have to move as much to try to burn more calories. It means your body's burning the calories on its own. It requires uh, quite a bit more clarification, unfortunately, because it's there's that's a whole education of the why. Like why should I um, build muscle as opposed to just go this route where I know that I can actually just at least lose the weight and I'll see that substantially out of the, out of the gates. Right. Right. I've, I've always thought too, that approaching this, like it's um, a marathon and in the things like eating less, doing cardio, doing all these things that we're talking about, they all can be like potential strategies and winning the overall race. But a terrible idea is to come out the gates in this long race that we have ahead of ourselves and do all these things. You're most likely going to burn your body out, or in this case, your metabolism out. And then what's going to end up happening halfway through this race, you're going to give up. We're going to get crushed because it's just like yeah. you can't sustain uh, that way of training for very long. And even if you could potentially get to your goal, you're not going to keep it there because it's not a, 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 a Literally sustainable place. the tortoise place. in the hair. Totally. Yeah. I mean, yeah. 100%. So the metabolism adapts um, to uh, the signals that it receives. So 
your body's metabolism is a very complex, very complex process. It can slow down and it can speed up. In other words, it can it can run off of more or less calories. Now, what determines whether or not it runs off of more or less calories are the signals and the inputs that it gets. This is what tells your body which direction to go. Now, one signal that will almost inevitably called, uh, uh, sorry, cause metabolic adaptation downward is simply reducing your calories. When you cut your calories, initially you'll see weight loss because now you're eating less than you're burning. Remember, if you're burning, let's say 2,000 calories a day and you're taking in 1,000, your body will burn body fat and weight in order to make up the difference. That's where it has that stored energy. But then what happens is your body starts to learn how to operate now on 1,000 calories. This is why you plateau. This is why an initial cut in calories results in some weight loss, but then you plateau very hard. And eating just eating less is a very strong signal that tells your body, slow down. Now, this is an evolutionary uh, thing that we have. This is, uh, it's a good thing. We want an a, a adaptive metabolism in the sense if, if we didn't do this, if our bodies didn't learn how to become more efficient with calories when we have less food, we wouldn't be here, right? We wouldn't be here. We wouldn't have survived famines um, or, or, or difficult situations. If your body just burned tons of calories, even though you're eating very little calories, um, we wouldn't have survived uh, for as long as, as humans have. So this right by itself is a signal that says, slow down. If your calories are well below what you're burning, that is going to tell your body to adapt uh, downward. Now, cardio uh, activity, although it's great for building endurance and stamina, does the same thing. And the reason why it does this is it burns a lot of calories while you do it, but it doesn't require much muscle to complete. It doesn't require strength. So you're taking in less calories, low calories, you're doing lots of cardio, which doesn't require much muscle. And your body's going to say, we need to slow down our metabolism. We need to be able to perform this task yeah. more efficiently, aka with less calories. And we're taking in less calories anyway. How do we slow down our metabolism? You lose muscle. This is why the data on uh, lots of cardio plus low calories results in sometimes 50% or more of the weight coming from muscle. Muscle is expensive tissue. It costs a lot of calories to maintain or to move or to be active. And so your body, one of the primary ways that it, it, it reduces its metabolic rate is by paring muscle down. So eating less and then doing lots of cardio, which requires very little strength and also burns a lot of calories while you do it, two very powerful signals that say, hey, slow down, become more efficient. I, I mean, I think there's something else that exacerbates that too. And when I think back to the clients that this was their strategy to lose weight, what often happens is they were eating, say, 2,000 something calories a day, not the best choices. They know that. And they say, okay, I'm going to cut these few things. I'm going to cut out the alcohol, the fast food, and I'm going to replace that with better choices or just completely skip it out entirely because they're going to try and reduce calories with no emphasis on the importance of hitting their protein intake every mm -hmm. single day. And then they add in cardio on there. So not only is uh, muscle an expensive tissue, not only does cardio send this signal that says, hey, we don't need a lot of muscle to run on this treadmill, but then you also pair that with most people that go in a calorie-restricted diet from their starting point also don't prioritize protein. And so it just, it accelerates that muscle loss. Like your body needs a certain amount just to tell it it wants to keep the muscle. You put it in a deficit, you eat even less protein than what you were before, you increase the, the cardio training, and it is a, a complete recipe for losing as much muscle, if not more, than what you lose body fat. And this happens all the time. This is why, uh, you know, I, I mean, I managed gyms for years, and anybody who's worked in gyms or worked in fitness for a long time knows this. You see these members. They, they come in like clockwork, religiously, uh, four days a week, five days a week. They're on cardio. And they do it every single day, oftentimes in the morning, and they look the same. Mm -hmm. They're the same, you know, they still have the same 25 pounds uh, uh, to lose. And they continue doing this. And then as a, as a gym manager, I thought, man, they must be just eating a lot of food. This is when I was early trainer. I didn't really understand what was going on. I thought, they must be eating a ton. Then I would meet and talk with these people. Some of them kept food logs, and they yeah. would show me. And I had women who were doing this. Yeah who were 20 pounds overweight, they would show me their food logs. They were eating like 1,200 calories a day. That was such a mystery to me as a trainer. Yeah, we, we thought they were lying. That. Yeah, I thought they were lying. <laughs> I, just, I couldn't 
couldn't fathom it. And then it's really frustrating for them because they're like, we're putting all this work in uh, and I think I'm doing all the right things. But literally, if I wasn't doing this, I would put weight on. And I'm like, oh, wow, that's the the state where they were in the plateau where it's like, you know, their body had adapted so well to their routine that any increase, it was like they felt that, you know. Hey, sorry to interrupt. This episode is brought to you by From Our Place. Uh, this is cookware that contains none of those forever chemicals. Protect your hormones, protect your family, eat with stuff that's clean. From Our Place, click on the link right here for a discount. All right, back to the show. Oh, th this reminds Sal recently has talked about how somebody mentioned to him that we do what's called grace based coaching or training. Grace based fitness. Yeah, grace based fitness. Where you got to coin that? I like that. I do like that, and and it and it does remind me of this conversation because I do remember this part of my journey as a as a coach of learning like, oh wow, these people aren't lying to me. Mm -hmm. These people have been trying really hard, yeah. and oh my god, imagine being in his or her spot where they're 100 pounds overweight and they're eating two salads a day and a chicken breast and maybe a bagel or something is like their entire meal and they're that overweight. Like imagine how difficult that must feel to be like, where do I go from here? And, you know, once I understood what was going on, what we're the point we're making and talking about right now it gave me a whole different approach. And I think that's where the beginning of this kind of like grace-based type of training began yeah. where I had so much more empathy for these clients that have struggled their way through this. And it then began, okay, how do I help them? And then also, how do I communicate this to them so that they don't get discouraged and then convince them that we're going to do a lot of things, probably the opposite yeah, of what they think. Completely the opposite. Yeah, a big, a big problem, you know, we, and we go back and we can kind of, break down why um, this became the message. I mean, focus on cardio for a second. Like why is cardio, why has that been for so long considered to be the best form of exercise uh, for fat loss or weight loss? Well, when you look at the the formula for weight loss or weight gain, right? This is, it's a, a calorie imbalance or an energy imbalance is what they'll say. Calories in versus calories out, which is true. I want to be very clear. This is a, a real thing. This is not false. And there's some wellness people out there that say, Calories in versus calories out doesn't matter. No, it does. This is the law. It's a law of physics. It's a real thing. Now, it oversimplifies, to be quite honest, everything. It's far more complex than just that, but it itself is a real thing. So when you look at it that way and you go, okay, I need to burn more calories than I take in. Okay, so let's look at the burn calories side of the formula. Let's look at all the forms of exercise and let's rank them in order of calorie burn. Well, then cardio becomes king. Because an, you know, 45 minutes of running is going to burn more calories than 45 minutes of almost any other form of exercise. Definitely more than 45 minutes of strength training, which burns very little calories. Especially traditional in, in strength training. Yeah, traditional in, in, in comparison. So that's what they did. They ranked them in order of calorie burn. But the problem with that is it completely ignores the adaptations that that form of exercise induces. The adaptations that are the most important thing that we need to look at because the adaptations are what stick around. Now, what are the adaptations that cardio causes on the body? Well, it does improve endurance and stamina. Look, if you want a lot of endurance and stamina, cardio is going to be one of your best ways to exercise. You want endurance, you got to train uh, for endurance. It's a great way to build that. But if you're looking for weight loss, well, we got to look at this and say, okay, what are the adaptations? I'm getting more endurance. That's that's cool. Uh, it's actually teaching my body to become more efficient with calories. In other words, because it's a high calorie demanding form of activity and my body wants to get better at it, it actually learns how to burn less calories while doing it. And it requires very little strength. Cardio, traditional cardio requires very little strength. So there's a very easy answer here for your body to become better at cardio. More stamina, burn less calories, reduce muscle. And the evidence of this is if you look at the like, the, the top distance runners in the world, they're very skinny. They have very little muscle in the bodies in comparison to, let's say, a sprinter who does more like a strength training uh, version uh, of running who's very muscular. So the body pairs muscle down to become better at this activity. So you actually mm -hmm. teach your body, or at least you send the signal to your body that says, all this muscle isn't advantageous. In fact, muscle is a disadvantage when you're doing lots of endurance-based training. This is why you don't see yeah. big, heavy, it's muscular- weigh you down. It's gonna weigh you down, you're gonna lose stamina. So it sends that signal. And then if you combine that with low calories, 
Well, now you got the double whammy and the body says, okay, we need endurance. We need stamina and we have to learn how to operate on low calories. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to really pare muscle down through other processes that are not fully understood. We're also going to become more efficient in other ways. We're going to slow this metabolism down. So to give an analogy, it would be like if I had a super advanced car that was AI and the car adapted to my driving habits. And let's say what I did every single day was I drove for six hours a day going 20 miles an hour every day. Well, what would my what would my car turn into? Well, it wouldn't have a, a V10 engine. It would become the most fuel efficient car uh, that it could become in order to get me to do this six hour commute for you know at 20 miles an hour. It would become a very small engine. It would be a banger. It would it would burn very little energy. This is what happens to your body when you beat it up with tons of cardio and you just cut your calories. Initially, you see weight loss because it takes some time for the metabolism to adapt, but once it adapts you are in a very hard plateau. And this is a terrible place to be because I can't tell you how many times I've seen this. And maybe this is you watching this right now. You're looking, you're tracking your calories and you're like, I'm eating 1300 calories a day and I'm doing all this cardio. I'm on the treadmill almost every single day. Where do I go from here? Do I cut my calories more? You don't want to do that. You don't want to keep going down. At some point you need those essential nutrients. And what are you going to do? Double the amount of cardio that you do? Unless you're a, a fitness maniac, nobody wants to do that. So it puts you in this really terrible position, which tends to result in a rebound. This is when people say, screw it, I'm done, and they gain tons of weight back. Well, and you just described what you called the, the double whammy. The triple whammy to that is the not eating enough protein. And we know what the, what the research says that the, when you're in a cut like this, this is a time when you should probably increase protein even yeah. more for the likelihood of potentially right. paring sure. down and losing muscle. And that's just not what happens when somebody goes in a cut. They go in a cut, they cut calories, and they just cut it from wherever, not realizing before they even went in the cut, they were probably under eating protein as it is. And now they're eating even less. And then they're doing the double whammy. You're saying it's now the triple whammy of yeah. losing muscle super, super fast. You know, you didn't put it on this list, but I would add it in this category of this portion of the conversation which is also the overuse and abuse of circuit training and lifting weights in a yeah. cardio like fashion. Well that is cardio. It's just right? you holding dumbbells. But people don't they, <laughs> yeah. people don't know yes. that. Yeah. People yeah. think when they take these classes like Orange Theory and F45 training. that they're like oh they're like oh that's not me. I'm not doing just cardio. I do a little bit of cardio, but I'm I'm mostly doing I'm weight using training. weights as well. Yeah, I'm saying. using weights, therefore I'm not seeing the same I'm not getting the same negative effect and that's not mm. true like if you are using weights in a fashion where you have low rest periods or no rest periods. or no rest periods and you're doing it in this circuit based fashion it's way more closer to you running on a treadmill than it is like you doing traditional yes. barbell squatting very very different adaptations that we're seeking when we're doing that circuit based training and i i would put that in this category of quick ways to slow down that metabolism. It's all endurance-based training. Mm -hmm. It's endurance-based training, not strength-based training. still focus on burning calories. That's right. The, the That's right. Uh, now, now, let's talk about fat burners here for a second. Uh, fat burner supplements. And those can be loosely categorized into two categories. One are the stimulant-based fat burners. These are the ones that quote-unquote work. And then ones that burn body fat in other ways that really don't do anything. Now, the stimulant-based ones can cause some initial weight loss, but it's not because they're burning more body fat, but rather stimulants tend to have an appetite suppressing effect. So when you go on, I remember back in the day, this, you can't do this anymore because they don't sell these, this particular supplement anymore. I don't think it's even legal uh, to do so. But back in the day, the most popular fat burner supplement, stimulant based fat burner supplement was the, what they called the ECA stack, the ephedra caffeine aspirin <laughs> stack. <laughs> The heart attack stack. Yeah. Ca <laughs> caffeine is uh, a stimulant. Ephedra, another strong stimulant. And people would lose weight on them. But that's, my, that's because those stimulants and stimulants in general tend to suppress your appetite and you eat less. Now, the problem with that is just like with caffeine. Let's stick with caffeine for a second because everybody has coffee. You know how great it feels to have coffee when you haven't had it in a while. But then when you have it every single day, it kind of loses its effect. That's because your body adapts to the stimulants. So if your appetite is suppressed initially from these fat burners, it won't be for long. And then you take them to remain the same. What do you think is going to happen when you come off? The rebound gets really nasty. Yeah. And this is what you saw 
with those very powerful fat burning supplements uh, in the 90s with the ECA stacks is you'd see this weight loss from the appetite suppression. Then they would adapt, not really notice anything. Then they'd go off of them and they'd gain the weight back and then some. Not to mention, eat, you know, when you're doing tons of cardio, eating very little, those are both stresses on the body. Stimulants are a stress on the central nervous system. That's why they're called stimulants. They stimulate the central nervous system. What you tend to see with these, uh, especially overuse, is you tend to see this kind of stress response, high cortisol, hormone imbalances, um, which is not favorable for fat loss, but rather it's favorable for muscle loss and for storing visceral body fat. This is why fat burners have never solved anything in the supplement world. They just don't work. They'll give you a, a, maybe a good feeling of energy for the first couple of weeks, but they don't work. Is, is it even legal to still call them fat burners? You can call they, they, is, There's a the whole category. Yeah. Is, is it still an actual yeah. true category? If like you were to Google or Amazon search yeah, that, is that fat come burning on? supplements? Because it, it's completely false advertisement. Yeah, I mean, totally. There's, it's, you're not taking a pill that is actually burning body fat. No. Mm. So it's not uh, not that at all. So it's interesting that the. I know it's not FDA rate. I know supplements aren't FDA regulated, but I would think that they can't even get, they wouldn't be able to get away with that still. They're still calling them that. Yeah. Really? Yeah. 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 Wow. yeah that's interesting yeah. to me because yeah. it's not, I mean, there's, and, and I think that's why they still sell as well, because you think you assume, why wouldn't you assume that you're buying fat burners? Why yeah. would you not assume that they help you burn body fat? Like it just no. seems logical if that's the name of them. But the fact that they could, I mean, can we create a category that's called just like a, something around muscle building or something just like false advertisement yeah. and sell? Although that also, Exists. I think you can look it up. <laughs> well, yeah, but there's some truth to that. Like yeah. creatine actually yeah. helps stimulate muscle yeah. growth. It's like right? in a roundabout way. Yeah, yeah. It achieves what they try to talk about. Now, the, the the one of the the last mistakes that people make is they skip meals. Now, this this wasn't a thing until I'd say maybe ten or fifteen years ago. Before intermittent, that, intermittent fasting. Yeah, because we've been we've been in the space for a long time, and I remember what we used to call skipping meals was starving yourself. So we used to say back in the fitness industry, then uh, it became very, fasting, by the way, just to be very clear, fasting has existed <clears throat> for thousands of years. It's 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 the first diet that was ever talked about <laughs> yeah. was fasting, but it was never to lose weight. It was always as a, as a spiritual process. It was always a disconnect, a practice of, of detachment yeah. yep. um, from worldly things. It's present in every major world religion. One of the side effects of not eating though is weight loss. So of course, uh, you know, with the with diet culture, they said, "Oh, fasting, let's re <laughs> let's rebrand this re a bit, as yeah. a way to lose weight. And if people don't eat, then they're going to lose weight, and it's going to be wonderful." And then they started attaching all these false promises to it, mm -hmm. like, "Oh, if you cut your calories, you get some benefit, but if you fast, you get more benefits." And there's cell autophagy, and there's all this other stuff that happens, which all happens with the calorie deficit. Doesn't matter if you fast or not. Um, it's a terrible approach. To fat loss, first off, it encourages uh, this this relationship with food that looks a lot like restrict and binge. Yep. Restrict and binge. Number two, if you ate the same amount of calories uh, as a, as another person, but that person ate all their calories in two meals, you ate all yours in let's say four meals spread throughout the day. The two meal person or the one meal person tends to have more stress markers, and we're starting to see this now. You're starting to see this more more common in women. Oftentimes, uh, some of my female clients would who would fast. We would send them to a functional medicine practitioner. It's affecting their hormones. And yeah, one of the first things they said was, "Don't skip meals anymore yeah. because this is causing stress on the body." It does elevate things like cortisol and stress hormones, which can feel good at first. Is why one of the reasons why people feel more energy. But I mainly the main reason why I don't like skipping meals. It makes it hard to hit your protein targets. And it also uh, it encourages this like restrict binge, restrict binge. Like I don't eat till three o'clock. I can't wait, can't wait. Then it, it comes around. It encourages a bad relationship going forward that's with right. food. And that's, you know, not preferable. I mean, as much as it's great to kind of uh, step back and reduce calories, you know, to skip a meal. This is just one of those things that just creates that sort of, uh, um, well, I can't have it. Like and it's almost like that punishing effect and now I can't have it. So it's it's just this urgency towards all of a sudden now I need to consume it all because I can. Hey, sorry to interrupt. Look, I have a free guide that teaches you how to lose fat in three steps, just three steps that will burn the most amount of body fat and help keep it off. This guide is totally free. We're giving it to everybody right now. If you want it, click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, back to the show. I'm just going to keep beating the protein drum because when you when we're the whole point of this conversation is about the metabolism and the you know for, for sure fire ways to slow your metabolism down and 
what do you want to do in order to build your metabolism? And one of the fastest ways to slow the metabolism down is to lose muscle off, off your body. It is definitely going to slow that down and slow it down. I mean, eating less, you've already pointed out, doing cardio, all those things. And then you continue to lose muscle. Every client that I've ever trained that doesn't matter if they were trying to lose weight, build muscle, doesn't matter what their journey was. When I assess their diet, the number one thing I have always had to communicate is we need to get more protein. And so if you take this person who is trying to get a faster metabolism or definitely doesn't want a slower one than they already have, this is a recipe for disaster. Is skipping. This is why I was actually even, I know that early on when we first started the show, we talked a lot about the myth behind lots of small meals. And it, those that have been listening for a long time probably remember that I kind of took a, a, an, an opposing uh, position on that. And my it wasn't that I didn't believe the science, right? We were very, the science is very clear. If you do one giant meal, it's the thermogenic effect that happens from that one giant meal is equal to four small meals. So there's no real difference. If the calories are the same, the thermogenic effect is the same. And so we've debunked the whole science around you want to have these small meals for a thermogenic effect. So that's been debunked. But I didn't like that messaging because what it did is started making people go like, oh, I don't need to eat a bunch of small meals. I'll just eat twice a day like I always do or three times a day. Which results in low protein. Which results, results yeah. in a really hard – most people don't eat hmm. 8 to 10 ounces of meat or more yeah. in a sitting. And if the average person eats two or three meals a day, this now becomes difficult for anybody over 130 pounds – to hit their protein intake. Yeah, it just yeah. is a fact. Yeah. And so I, this is the thing that I, I cannot stress to the listener enough is when I have somebody who wants to go on a fat loss journey, lose weight, the first thing I actually start doing is adding to the diet. And the first thing that we add to the diet is protein. I tell them, okay, here's what I want you to do. I'm not going to tell you take away or do cardio, do this so that I want you to make sure you hit your protein intake. Go after that. Mm -hmm. And what ends up happening when they go after that protein intake is naturally the other stuff falls off the back end and they make better food choices, not to mention they are now feeding their body what it needs in order to hold on to that protein yeah. and inevitably will help them build their metabolism. By the way, high protein in the context of what we're talking about is about a gram of protein per pound of target body weight. So that's why Adam said, you know, if you're over 130 pounds, I mean, you're eating 140 grams of protein. And what are you going to do? You're gonna two meals? Yeah. Uh, 70 grams of protein in two meals? Difficult to Or 140 see. grams of protein in one meal? I can't do that myself. Right. Let alone 140 As, as a little 140-pound girl or guy. Like, that's yeah. small. It's just not going to happen. By the way, with muscle loss, uh, what, you know, we're talking about slowing your metabolism down with losing muscle. Losing muscle also makes it harder for your hormones to do what they do effectively. So like like a, a couple, there's a few hormones involved. Well, all the hormones are involved to some extent with muscle building and fat loss, but like a testosterone, very important. This is both for men and women. And then how sensitive your, your body is to insulin can also impact your body's fat gain or fat loss, right? We know this. We know when you start to lose insulin sensitivity, when you start to become insensitive to insulin or, or you can become pre-diabetic, like you just tend to store more body fat. We also know that testosterone is a body composition changing hormone. If you take a man who's low testosterone and you have his, him raise his testosterone or a woman with low testosterone, have her raise her testosterone, they tend to have more muscle, less body fat, regardless of the calories and all that stuff. So those are very important things for body composition. Well, here's why muscle is so important. First of all, building muscle you increase the amount of androgen receptors that you have in your body. In fact, the androgen receptors you have in your body, they're all over, but a lot of them are in muscle. So when you lose muscle, you lose androgen receptors. All right, what are those things? Those are the receptors that testosterone attaches to so that testosterone can do what it does, okay? So if you have good testosterone as a man or woman and your androgen receptors are cut in half because you lost half your muscle, that testosterone is now doing way less of its job, even though it stayed the same. Or to put it differently, if I doubled your androgen receptor density, it's like having twice as much testosterone. By the way, just to be clear, testosterone is just as important for women as it is for men. The levels are different, but the same things that testosterone does for men, builds muscle, burns body fat, gives you energy, confidence, all that stuff. It's the same things that it does uh, for women. Insulin sensitivity, let's talk about that for a second. One of the easiest, fastest ways to improve your sensitivity to insulin or how little insulin you need in order for your body to take carbohydrates or sugars and shuttle them into the body oh, to be muscle. utilized is to have muscle. Muscle is a storage vessel mm -hmm. for those things. Losing muscle is a fantastic way 
to becoming less sensitive to insulin. So it's not just that you get a faster metabolism or a slower metabolism. It's also my hormones are more or less effective. You are essentially, by losing muscle, turning yourself into a better fat storage machine. Yeah. With more muscle, you are turning yourself into a better fat burning machine. Now back to protein, you know, when they look at the, when, when you look at the studies on protein, on high protein, like we're talking about, one gram of protein per pound of target body weight. If you compare groups of people eating the same calories, they're consuming the same amount of energy, except one group is high protein and the other group is eating the FDA recommended protein, which is low. The group that eats more protein has more muscle and less body fat. More muscle, less body fat, same calories. So you're going to want to eat more protein. So instead of eating less, don't do that. Increase your protein intake, lift weights, strength train, avoid the fat burners, and don't skip meals because that'll make it impossible for you to hit your protein targets. Doing those things slowly speeds up the metabolism. And I say slowly because I want people to be, to be patient here. You're not going to get that initial quick 10 pounds of weight loss that you may get, which again, half of it coming from muscle, that you may get from just cutting calories and doing tons of cardio. It'll be a little slower. However, I will say this, part of the reason for that is you're losing fat and building muscle. So the scale might not move, but you'll look smaller. I, I can't tell you how many times I would have a client in the first 60 days uh, of training with me come to me and say, coworkers are telling me I'm losing weight, even though I know I have it. Say, well, you lost fat and you gained muscle. You're smaller because muscle's dense. You'll look better but your metabolism is faster. So as the metabolism speeds up, the fat loss looks different. Instead of that initial fat loss and plateau or weight loss and plateau, you see a snowball effect of fat loss where it accelerates as you continue on this progress, not hitting plateaus and setting yourself up for long-term success because now a fast metabolism allows you flexibility to eat more food and to live your life. By the way, one last uh, like wonderful point here, strength training requires less uh, in order to exert its adaptation benefits. In other words, one or two days a week of strength training will build muscle, will make you stronger, will boost your metabolism. Cardio, you want to burn a lot of calories cardio, you got to do it every single day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's another reason why uh, you know strength training is just the, the, the best form and of And the beautiful, you talk about that snowball effect. What's what's really cool about that slow process of building the mu building your muscle, increasing calories, reverse dieting, and it like slowly and then all of a sudden it starts to accelerate, is not only does the fat loss accelerate, but it does it while you're simultaneously eating more than what you were before. <laughs> That's right. Which is like mind it's blowing. Mind blowing. You take you want to radically change a client's life is you take that client that we started off talking about, which has only been eating, they're only eating 1,300 calories a day, they're 100 pounds overweight. Get a gram of protein per pound of target body weight, lift weights once or twice a week, mm -hmm. and don't skip meals, and then watch what happens. Yes. It blows them away. Yeah, that same client, you have them down six months down the road, and now all of a sudden, they're losing more weight than they ever had. They're eating twice as they've ever <laughs> ate before. They look way better, they're stronger, their energy's up, their hormones are better. Like, it's just, it's so life-changing to, it, it's just hard. It's hard to get somebody stuck here, mm -hmm. uh, to, to get out of that trap, because it is a vicious trap and cycle that you can get into, but it most certainly is the right path. It's the fastest path. It's the most effective path. It's the it's one that's going to keep- the right path. Yes. It, it's the one the that the you're day. going to be able to sustain for the rest of your life, and if you could just trust the process and stay focused and do that. You know, one, one thing here, I do want to say this, for someone wondering how much faster they can make their metabolism- uh, routinely, routinely, I would get somebody's metabol metabolic rate to go up by 500, 800, 1,000 calories. It wasn't unheard of for me to get someone's metabolism even faster than 1,000 calories. And I'm talking about everyday average people who are middle-aged. I'm not even talking about younger people who are already healthy and all that stuff. So it will happen, and it will happen reliably so long as you're, as you're consistent and patient. All right, we've got some questions here. The first one is, how many calories does a pound of muscle burn? Oh yeah. boy, controversial question. Yeah, so this this one's uh, controversial because when you if you look this up, uh, what you'll see is a pound of muscle at rest burns six calories, whereas a pound of body fat at rest burns like a calorie or something like that. So it's like, oh, it's not that much more. First of all, it is a lot more if that were simply true by itself. But number two, the metabolism is way more complex than that, okay? way more complex than that. In fact, simply sending the signal to build muscle and starting to feed yourself more before you build muscle already gets your metabolism to burn more calories. In other words, same lean body mass, but you're burning more calories. 
The metabolism is quite complex. There's many mysteries to it, but the process of speeding up the metabolism is a lot more than just this many pounds of muscle burns. Because I would get, you know, when I say I would routinely get people's metabolisms up by 800, it's not like these people that were training would gain 20 pounds of muscle. They're right. Like, Eight pounds of muscle. That's five what pounds of muscle. Connect is yeah. Yeah, like if I if I got a woman, a female client, to gain eight pounds of muscle, and we did this right, you, typically they're burning eight hundred more calories a day. Uh, what does that translate to? hundred, you know, calories per pound of muscle. It's there's a lot more going on than just. Uh, what, there's way more. This I, this I'm I'm glad they asked this question, but I also really get fired up yeah, when I see people the in wrong our, question. Yeah, when I see people in the space having this debate of. They try and come out and they debunk, oh, someone like Sal saying, oh, I got a girl to add 10 pounds of muscle and she's now eating 800 more calories. They try and come around and be like, oh, that's bullshit. This is what the science says. <laughs> Eight pounds of muscle only equates to an extra 50 calories a day. There's no way that he increased her metabolism. The fat. And that is such a terrible message. And it's so stupid because you're you're like they're, they're literally taking out like comparing this the muscle versus the fat as, as, in idle in a lab in a situation like that when you're not accounting for that person who you got to build eight pounds of muscle what we what you know they had to do they had to have good programming they had to uh, recover properly which means they're probably sleeping, sleeping better yep. their hormone profile is probably improving if not significantly all these things okay are going to impact their total calorie burn and their metabolism. And that's what we know. Mm -hmm. Back to your point about how complex the metabolism, we don't even fully grasp it. But what we can tell you from people that have been doing this for well over two decades, look, it definitely makes a massive look, difference. Well, if you look at the body too as a machine and we have all the building components and the way that we're setting it up, this machine just works at a higher level, at a, at a more optimal level, if this is the direction that we go with it. So Yeah, you know, and, and this reminds me of that study that I bring up all the time, and there's other studies that have, that have been done on this, where the study that I typically quote was the one done on modern hunter-gatherers, where the Hadza tribe. scientists went to northern Tanzania and studied the Hadza tribe, and through sophisticated testing, were able to test their metabolic rates. Now, they, these are hunter-gatherers, okay? They don't have electronics. They don't sit down and watch TV. They don't have social media. They hunt and they gather, meaning they're gathering. And when they hunt, they'll throw a spear at something, wound it, and chase it for miles until it gets exhausted. They should be burning a ton of calories. And and, they, and you know what they found? They burned right around the same calories as the average couch potato. What What's going on here? How's that possible? <coughs> they're moving so much. Well, our body's adapted to be able to become efficient because if we were hunter-gatherers with super fast metabolism, we'd be dead. Yeah. So And now what kind of activity do they engage in? Lots of cardio with with low calories. Their yeah. metabolism slowed down. So, so that's just the point I want to make. So it's not as easy as one pound of muscle. It's the process that we're talking about that leads to the faster metabolism. Yeah, it's all the habits. Hey, sorry to interrupt. It's October. Maps Muscle Mommy is fifty percent off, half off. If you're interested, click on the link below. All right, back to the show. What is the best type of strength training for fat loss? I love this question. There is no different type of strength training for fat loss and muscle building and whatever. The best type of strength training program is the one that builds the most strength, yeah. period, end of story. Slash muscle. That's it. So if you want to get the best strength training program for fat loss, follow the one that is producing the best strength gains for you yeah. uh, and the, the best muscle gain for you. That's going to be the best one for fat loss. Of all of our programs, for most people, because we have a lot of programs, of all of our programs, MAPS Anabolic is probably the one that I say generally is probably the best for most people in this category. And if you're the type of person that does a lot of reps typically, and this is just something that you've done continuously over the years, and if you change it to low reps and um, you know switch it out in terms of the strength heavy strength focus on that you're going to see uh, a new stimulus which also helps aid in, in new muscle gain this well this is why mass anabolic is the way to go this is also what highlights the brilliance of when sal originally created that wrote that i re, you know I, I remember where i was at in in my journey of, of coaching and helping people and at that point realizing that most people that want to weight train for fat loss typically do the circuit training or the high rep, low rest period mm -hmm. type of training. And I always knew that if I took that client and I put them on a five by five long rest period, got them to get really strong, they would see more fat loss yeah. than they'd ever seen from strength training. So totally new stimulus. And so that's the reason why MAPS anabolic phase one becomes this like magical thing for so many people. And they see such great results from it is it has a lot to do with understanding the type of client that wants to speed their metabolism up, that wants to lose body fat 
that tends to be, you know, for 80% of the population or clients that we've trained, that tends to be the best place to start. Is creatine good for fat loss? Oh, I love this. Yeah, creatine, typically known as a muscle building supplement, actually is probably one of the best quote unquote fat loss supplements. Now, I'm not going to, I'm not saying that creatine is going to make you lose all this body fat, but indirectly through its muscle building process is, is the best supplement to use for this metabolism boosting effect. Aside from anything you may be missing, like if you're missing your protein, protein powder can help. If you're missing a nutrient, you don't want to have a nutrient deficiency. But if everything's good, creatine, it fuels the cells. It's a longevity supplement. It's healthy for you across the board. It also helps the muscle building process. It's going to help this metabolism boosting process. It's funny because creatine has never been marketed as a fat loss supplement. Yeah. But if you were to break it all down, it's actually the best one. There's a caveat to this because if you are somebody who's trying to lose weight, many times you are married to the scale and you have a very hard time looking at, not looking at that and judging your results based off what happens to scale. And what creatine will do is it will hold more water in the muscles, which ultimately will make you look better and make your body your look mu better. Your muscles are hydrated and, and full. Better. Yes, and you'll yes. perform better, you'll look better. So 100% you went up a couple it is, pounds on the scale. but you might see two or three pounds go up on the scale because you started taking creatine yeah. and that freaks people out oh, and makes yeah. them think that it's a bad idea. Hysteria. But it couldn't be further from the truth. It's, you know, there, there is a difference between your body uh, being puffy and retaining uh, water from, you know, inflate in, uh, inflammation. And there's a difference between your body holding water in the muscle bellies because of the cellular water Water that it's holding from like something like creatine that will actually make the muscles make the shape of the body look better and is an excellent uh supplement for fat loss but be prepared for the psychological game that'll play on you when the scale goes up what are the best strength training exercises oh the the best ones are what are known as is these gross motor movement or compound lifts the reason why they're the best and i'll, I'll list some of them but the reason why they're the best is they do the, the work of, you know, the five next exercises, okay, on the list. So they just, a lot of bang for their buck. They produce a lot of results, great strength, great muscle, great metabolism boost for just doing one exercise. So, you know, barbell squats, a barbell deadlift, you know, overhead presses, bench presses, rows, like those are just great exercises for what they can produce for the time spent doing them. They're just great bang for your buck exercises. All right, I know you liked that episode. If you did, check this one out. 30% body fat. For men, this is way too high. This is actually a bit high for women as well. So in today's episode, we're talking about how you can go from 30 to 10. What is 10% body fat? This is when you have a visible six pack. Can you go from 30 to 10%? Yes, it's possible but not if you guess along the way. So we're gonna talk about how you can do that in today's episode. Now there's a huge range, right? Of like body types. Yes. Some people can run uh, a little bit heavier uh, and, or a little bit higher body.